Gene, it's good to see you again. Hello, James. It's a pleasure seeing you as well. How are you doing? Doing good. So uh, you and I were talking, and and one of the things we talked about is how oftentimes the same old ideas are given new window dressing and then and then marketed again. And would you like to talk about that a bit and kind of respond to that? Mm, I like your analogy. Uh, just to make sure I fully understand it, I'll give a, a short version of my own. Is it like putting a new label on something that has been already uh, manufactured and sold once and now you're trying to resell it with a different label or uh, taking a few ideas, a few pieces of merchandise and staple them together, putting your own unique label on it and trying to resell it. Is that I think a- we see both, right? Okay. So- I think we see the same thing rebadged and I think we see, you know, two or three things mixed together, but it's the same, you know, ingredients yeah. in a different mix. Um and and they're really nothing new, you know. Right. So I, I guess our analogy is different, but the the it, it we are trying to create it around the same exact problem. Uh, so my, my take is this. Well, first of all, Agile Manifesto and Scrum uh, give or take twenty years plus in making. I rather see today a high percentage of companies being consistent with basic principles of Agile. Agile Manifesto, and I'd rather see a high percentage of companies that are able actually to demonstrate rudimentary success with Scrum than uh, companies trying to amplify um, and, and, and put on steroids those two very basic uh, things, Agile, Manif- Agile and Scrum, and, um, and give them a different name. I personally feel that there are certainly market trends that describe what you uh, created analogy for, uh, you know, putting a new dressing on the old window. <sighs> what can I say? Uh, I guess there is, if there is a demand, there will be always supply. Uh, what I see a lot, and um, I actually don't like what I see, is that there are consultancies, smaller companies, larger size companies, and oftentimes individuals that are very successful business entrepreneurs that um, know how to get the best out of the situation. And they essentially, you know, see there is demand, right? So they see there is demand and there are opportunities to sell and sometimes upsell. And they take good old ideas and they essentially like refurbish them, re repackage them into almost their own now. And uh, by giving them a tiny twist of wording or a tiny, you know, tweak in uh, the way they phrase it, the way they frame it, they find an opportunity to upsell it. Now, um, a good consumer, uh, um, an educated consumer, as I call them, a smart reader, a smart listener, would be able to tell um, a real new thing or a a new bright idea that is um, genuinely, authentically bright and new from the aforementioned refurbished, repackaged, uh, good old stuff. Uh, but majority of readers and and, um, and and listeners are probably not as upskilled and informed, and that's how we end up having lots of um, transactional activity out there, if you will, with some companies and individuals and organizations that are behind these um, upsell up sales, taking advantage of companies of organizations, and uh, I guess you know it's transactional business and money changes hands. What are your thoughts? What's your observation? Uh, Do you have any? I think there's a lot of money to be made selling the illusion of change because real change is hard. And the things that worked years ago, that is to say, you know, cross-functional, cross-component teams, really good test-first practices, um, getting the people doing the work as close to the customer as possible. I mean, you go back to XP, it does that. The concepts are not new. Um, The idea that you don't really want to scale in the first place is not new. But if you do scale, you wish to scale with as little ceremony as possible, as flat of an organization as possible. And you want to be very careful of what the incentives are. To change an organization and make those structural changes, you know, is a threat to the existing power structure typically. And it's 
very emotionally hard to accept that level of change. It's a whole lot easier to go pick the next fad diet, right? That's much easier than the real thing. Not that, you know, personally, you know, I'm sure I could use some help there, but, uh, I think what I need to do health wise is not any different than it was 30 years ago. And I think the same is true for companies. So, uh, it, what, what, any, any more thoughts, Gene? I think you had a few more. Yeah. So, so first of all, I do agree, right? So a diet is a diet is a diet, right? So everyone has to decide what they should do for themselves. And, uh, although maybe science moves ahead and, um, research becomes richer and more inclusive, there was more content to, to leverage. At the end of the day, most of the fundamentals, um, are the same and, uh, trivializing and reducing those in essence and importance um, in favor of something new that actually is based on the very fundamentals they're being dismissed makes no sense. Uh, just a, uh, an additional extension to, to, my, to my previous point, uh, not only do I think it's somewhere um, disservicing to organizations and to the industry as a whole to uh, continue creating and creating and creating and putting more and more and more and you know m more and more of new stuff out there without really um, improving, uh, let alone perfecting on the good old concepts. What I also uh, observe, and I think it's you know borderline of being almost inappropriate, some uh, entities or individuals sometimes, uh, in order to upsell their own stuff, they need to trivialize, marginalize. Uh, or ridicule, or do some not so meaningful compare and contrast of things that are already out there and actually have been proven well. It's almost like it, the the what rem, what this reminds me of is you can't really sell your own uh, uh, dish uh, washing detergent unless you badmouth all other brands. <laughs> you can't really tell how yours is so much better unless you tell how previous brands were not so successful <laughs> in, in washing dishes. And that, that's a, the same trend, the same observation I'm seeing, uh, I'm, I'm having with, within the industry you and I work in where, oh, my framework is the best thing since sliced bread, God gives to mankind, and it's so amazing, so special, so unique, for crying out loud, it's just the, you know, picking and choosing from everywhere. Um, Actually, just it's a jambalaya, you know. And uh, I always, I always, I always wonder why do you need to trivialize um, something else that was there in the first place that actually does work on the proper conditions. So anyway, uh, I think you get in the drift, right? So it's almost like, you know, yeah. yeah well, I mean, what you, what so you, much what of this, yeah. so much of this is situational. I mean, a different context. Uh, if you weren't doing product development, I would argue there's a lot of heavier weight product management techniques that are appropriate. It's just not appropriate in the something as complex as product development to to outsource the the project management away from the people that are on the team. I believe the professionals doing the work deserve the ability to do that, which I think was another thing that we discussed is that. You know, I'm always a lot more comfortable taking counsel from those who have had experience in the trenches doing the actual product development work, not managing those who do, but people who have, have done it. Um, if you were in another field, if you were an electrician, usually the boss at one point had a tool belt himself. And the same is true of a mechanic and the same is true of a, uh, you know, of a, of a surgeon who is teaching a younger surgeon how to do their work the surgeon doesn't pay a lot of attention to what the hospital administrator says about how to do surgery properly. Um, and, and I think that that is, is a, is a challenge as well. Now I accept that the reality is I know for myself, as I have spent time doing, you know, organizational design consulting and, and agile adoptions and this sort of thing, I'm not slinging code on a day to day basis. And because I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not current like I would otherwise be. To be really up to speed again, I would have to, you know, join a team for six months, nine months, learn a lot from my teammates, and before long, I'd be back up to speed. 
but it would take time. So I suppose what I'm most sensitive to is someone who has at least done enough of the work long enough. Usually it takes several years, uh, in my case, more than a decade to really understand the nature of the work. And a token project is not the same as production code. It's just not the same thing. Yeah. Um, so uh, we should be sensitive. We don't have a lot more time. Anything you want to wrap up with, Gene? Uh, I think you, you, what the point you just re the last point you made is um, I agree with it. First of all, um, I just I'll just add the you know a small additional uh, flavor to it. When you combine the uh, overarching issue that we uh, initially mentioned, the you know the new magnificent um, you know m mysterious frameworks in the first place when you combine this problem with uh, the problem of having you know so many less than informed less than experienced people pedaling it driving it um, and it becomes a, you know a pretty pretty dangerous mixture and uh, one of these cases um, uh, one of such cases would be when you have people that have been historically, traditionally very remote from product development of product management internally, organizationally, now uh, being put in charge of agile enterprise transformation and creating what that, that's the language you know organizations like to use agile operating model. I just love it. I mean, I, it just blows me, um, you know, blows me out of the water. So they less than informed people don't really understand product development, product management, don't have a history uh, of being agile change agents, adaptive change agents. Now they're in charge of creating an operating model, aka a framework, internal framework. So you end up with, uh, you know, something that probably works in theory on a PowerPoint. Yeah. Thank you, Gene. Um, and thank you, everyone, for listening. The content here can be found on uh, both of our YouTube channels. That is to say, Agile Carpentry and you. what did you call your YouTube channel? It's a little um, different. Adaptive Ecosystems. Adaptive Ecosystems YouTube channel. Also on both of our websites, as well as on Spotify under the Agile Carpentry channel and under most podcasts, but you'll only get the, uh, the, the audio only outside of Spotify. Anyway, thank you again for listening and hope you have a wonderful holiday. Thank you, folks. Thank you, James.